and now we will have the second keynote lecture and this is from dr arvind kumar from international rice research institute and he is many of you already are aware he is very dedicated plant breeder and who has always been proactive in implementing genomics tools in his breeding program i think few years back he identified seven major qtls for grain yield under drought qtls for increased adaptability of rice to dry direct seeded situation and then not only that he identified he started to use these qtls interesting thing is that they were not used only in iri but several other breeding programs across the world i should also mention that he more than 60 varieties have been released in different countries of asia and africa from his work this doesn't mean that he is very old he is still very young and he and i always keep on talking about the new uses of the genomics and breeding program for instance rice folks they develop 3000 rice genome sequencing data so we always keep on talking how we should mine these kind of sequence data used in the breeding program so this strengthens the relationship between icris and nirri but also the exchanges of the ideas between us i should also mention that he was supposed to be with his boss uh, jackie huge that deputy director general research at irri today but somehow we have been successful to bring him away sneak him away from his boss and he is here now i am sure that he will not be very unhappy but you will be have make or convinced so with these words please jo join me in welcoming arvin for this talk here it's a uh, still good morning between good morning and good afternoon uh, to all of you uh, at the onset uh, i thank ikrisat uh, and rajiv wasne for inviting me to this important uh, symposium and uh, i am thrilled to deliver this presentation in presence of many of the the dignitaries uh, probably who are equivalent to to my teachers uh, dr h s gupta dr p k gupta dr r p sharma i still remember when he was doing biotechnology i was doing my msc also a number of dignitaries uh, good to have dr pravin rao g p singh was here bilas topani p k agrawal o p yadav n p singh dr a k singh he just left a k p bishnathan and uh, friends from timit friends from private sector i see raman here uh, number of dignitaries from ikri set dr kiran sharma rajiv gupta puran gaur and jain diwan uh, the first presentation sets the stage of uh, how breeding is changing and i think uh, i will be talking around 20% of application of speed breeding that we have been doing at hiri and the way i have tried to bring this presentation is that how other institutes many of whom we are working can apply the, the, these uh, principles and procedures and practices into their breeding program so i will i will move ahead with this uh, this is what uh, dr gupta i started with in his lecture you now the the dwarf varieties in wheat then the dwarf variety in the rice and we know how the whole world has changed uh, we were predicted not to survive and uh, we are well ahead of uh, matching the population growth with the yield uh, several ir8 tn1 jaya in india that is part the green revolution and in fact now farmers can harvest 5 to 7 ton in place of 1 to 3 ton that that was coming but then equally important is that how these varieties we have been moving forward is spreading these varieties ir8 was replaced with ir36 and then ir64 and in fact uh, 
there is a there is a study which says at one point of time IR64 was grown on 10 million hectares area, and uh, there are several examples in India. Sorna sub one was grown. Sorna was grown on six million hectares. SMTU 1010, BR29, and in fact uh, we all know the story of Pusa 1121. How how this has been. But then this is all. Those breeders were so nice that even if they didn't have the technology, they could develop these varieties. And now we have these molecular technologies of what we are doing. So that's interesting. I, I, I put this slide, uh, I remember four years back in ECRIP, uh, one of the lectures that I gave in ECRIP, All India Coordinated Rice Improvement Program, that uh, as time passes, uh, the first thing I would say that when, when I came into BSC AG program, the first definition that I learned was plant breeding is the art and science of improving the genetic architecture of the plant. And uh, when I started doing the plant breeding, it was mostly conventional breeding. And then I think today I do around 60% or 70% of the, the molecular breeding and 40% of the conventional breeding. I don't say that art is not important. Art is as important as it was earlier, but then we breeders have to use more and more science into our breeding program. Uh, I will bring few examples that how we are moving forward, marker-assisted breeding, backcross breeding, to marker-assisted selection, and then to, to the genomic-assisted breeding, and then using the Part of the speed breeding, I won't say that we are as advanced as what uh, was presented in the previous presentation, but then how we are moving ahead. This uh, sub one, I, I, I have no hesitation in saying the sub one changed the way that we tackle the abiotic stresses. There were people working on the biotic stresses, the major genes, but then sub one was probably the first example where we learned how we tackle the the abiotic stresses. It took nearly 14 years to identify sub-1 and develop the Swarna sub-1 varieties. I don't think we will have 14 years now to do that. Similar story with the drought, the lessons that we learned, we identified QTLs for drought, and in fact it took us uh, 10 years to bring the varieties for the drought tolerance that are being cultivated now by, by farmers. Number of varieties for both the submergence and drought tolerance have been released. And in fact, we talk about the varieties which combines multiple stresses. We talk about drought tolerance plus submergence tolerance. We talk about drought plus high temperature plus submergence. We talk about drought plus high temperature plus cold. Probably we never thought that high temperature and cold can be combined earlier, but these are moving ahead. And then we moved to, to marker assisted selection. And we started following speed breeding. Fortunately, I was at Philippines. I am at Philippines. And we can have three seasons of rice. You know, and that is where we started having three generations of the population improvement. So a program that I started, a crossing program that, that we started in 2015, this is what uh, was mentioned in earlier that how we bring the disease resistance, the, the drought tolerance, the, the insect resistance, and the grain quality into the breeding program. And I started this program based on the conviction, based on the confirmation that I had with the marker assisted by cross breeding that why can't I tackle eight genes, 10 genes bringing together? And in fact, uh, I'm happy to say that today, 2018, which is four years now, we have the homozygous lines with eight to 10 genes together. We had few failures, but we had some successes. And in fact, these, these lines are ready for testing. In fact, we are working with many of the institutes in India to improve these, many of the varieties for bringing disease and drought tolerance and insect resistance together. This is what we have done and uh, what's new coming. 
In 2016, I think we started talking about that plant breeding is a teamwork. And with uh, genomic information coming forward, how the team captures more on the information that is coming forward and we use it into the breeding program. And evidently, it led to change of the structure that breeding rather than being done by one breeder, it is done by the whole team. And so we, the, the ED changed its structure. We became into five different platforms, and rice breeding platform was one. And you can see that then we had uh, uh, different clusters within the rice breeding pl platform. And then each of us were assigned the job that what we will be doing, and then we move on. And so within the cluster, you can see it's, it's more like less like a structure that is prevalent in the private sector, but a little bit of, with little bit of variation that, that there has to be a breeding project lead, which is the, the varietal development person. Then there are regional hubs, which are in, in Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa. Then there is a genetic project lead. Then there is a trade project lead. And then they, we also combine with, with other institutes. Putting this structure, the two slides on the structure, which is away from sciences, just to, to bring you to when I talk about the trade development. And so we sat down, and then we started classifying that for how many countries we breed for. We came up that we breed for 18 different countries. And then how many breeding zones we can classify them. We came up that we can classify them into five breeding zones. And in fact, uh, this is one of the breeding zones you can see, breeding zone three, which is, which is there. And these are the countries. This is the ecosystem. And then you can see what is the size of the ecosystem, what are the, the abiotic stress needed, what is the biotic stress needed, what is the, the quality needed, and what is the duration needed. Why this? Because this led us to our next concept, which is the product profile. And the requirements of the breeding zone determines what traits has to be into your product profile. So when the first, the concept of product profile was told to me, I was a little bit hesitant. I had this feeling that I know everything that I'm breeding for. And in fact, every breeder had that feeling that he knows everything that he is breeding for. So they started talking to me, which disease? I said BLB, but BLB, blast, brown plant hopper, which insect? I said galmid, PPH, which quality? I said intermediate amyloids, no long grain. And then came which gender equivalent trait that you use, which is liked by women? I had no answer. How much you integrate with the traders and millers? What trade they want? I said they want uh, high head rise recovery. But then they also told us they want branch size is very thin, so that you know it increases, which I didn't know. So evidently that told us that probably we need to have a product profile. And the product profile is just not determined by the breeder but determined by number of stakeholders which are involved. That involves farmers also, and women farmers also, who are, who are also the consumers, the traders. And that is what we have started doing. So in our case at ERI, that what a breeder will breed is not decided by just the breeder, but in fact you can see a gender specialist who will be determining the product profile for different region in participation with the breeder. And so why product profile? So that we really give importance to everything and in fact to ensure that product is liked in the market and in, in the process of development of the product profile, it is just not what is existing now, but we have to think what will exist in 10 years from now. And that is very difficult for a person to capture everything. We can capture it as a group, but not individually we can capture everything. 
And so once you have the product profile, once you have the breeding zone, once you have the product profile, that is what will determine the trade development. And in fact, I have no hesitation in saying that Erie has a very strong trade development pipeline. We worked on bacterial blight resistance and several of the genes are used worldwide. We worked on blast resistance and several of the genes are used worldwide. And we continue to work on the new traits. So just an example, we are working on anaerobic germination. We very well understand that in years to come, rice will not have enough water to be cultivated like transplanted rice, and we will be moving towards the direct seeded rice, but we will, the climate change will continue to haunt us, and when we go for direct seeded rice, we may have initial large rain and where this anaerobic germination will help. Then stagnant flooding. In rice, flood is a very severe problem, and we are doing trade development for the stagnant flooding, and we are using the 3K panel that has been sequenced, and in fact, we identify the peaks, then we use the, we, we, we use either biparental or we, we try to know the genes, and then we use it in the breeding program. Extended submergence, sub one provides submergence tolerance up to 15 days. We are moving towards uh, tolerance for 30 plus days. And uh, there are many areas, if you go to Bihar and Uttar Pradesh and Assam, where there is a submergence for around a month, and we are trying to, to tackle this problem also. QTLs for granule under drought is moving ahead. We, there are at least six QTLs, which I would say rice breeding program across the world are, are using it. Recently, we have started working on nutrition QTLs for high iron and high zinc, but worth mentioning is because of the time limitation salinity, high temperature, cold, nutrient availability under low fertility, nutrient availability under direct seeded rice, and quality traits, traits including glycemic index. Post plant resistance, we continue to work on. The, we have say, I have said that we, we have worked a lot on bacterial blight, blast, brown plant hopper, blunt, brown, brown spot, BPH, we have started working on a large scale on seed blight and false smut, the emerging diseases. And uh, we, we continue to move ahead with that. We have developed a platform for informed decision on pests and diseases. And in fact, uh, this is running well in, in Philippines. This is running well in Indonesia. And in fact, uh, it gives information that which biotype of this disease is prevalent there and which gene you can use in the breeding program. And in fact, people are using it. We have every plan to come to, to India from 2019. So more than the trade development, what I wanted to say through this trade development is that there is a group doing the trade development. And their job ends when the trade development is done. And so you do the trade development, you publish in there, people use it. But then you are not going to do the breeding. There is another group who is doing the, the trait integration. And this is being led by genetic project lead, so where the trait comes with the, that this is the QTL, this is the marker. Then he will see that how good is the marker. And then he will try to find map it. He will develop the, the more closely linked markers. And then he uses it into the integration, into elite lines. And not many breeding programs does it. If you see most of the breeding program, what they do is they use the traditional lines into the breeding program and they carry a lot of linkage drag. We develop the, the accurate markers for many of the, the genes and QTLs uh, and those are listed here. But then we also find out that most of the breeding lines which are in the cultivation they have very low frequency of number of alleles, which are very important. And in fact, we have taken this task of increasing the allele frequency of important genes into elite lines so that they are used in, in the breeding program. And then 
we have the tolerance to and also the quality captured into our bidding profile. And this is the place, this is the group who deploys all the QTLs and genes into elite breeding lines. And then once it is done, this, whether this is for abiotic stress or whether it is for biotic stress, then it goes to the, uh, or hybrid rice. Hybrid rice is also doing, in, moving in the, in the same way. They are using different genes and QTLs into their breeding program. And also taking the forward breeding approach for the hybrid rice. Now the whole process, or, or what I wanted to say here is, that it's not one person doing this. The, the, the research moves on from one group to the other group. From 2017, we started doing this cross-cutting. I came from a university where I had to do my crossing. I had to grow my F1. I had to grow my F2. And ideally, we are moving away from that. What crosses you want, you just give the list. Or you give the parents. They will verify that parents are pure. I verify with markers that parents are pure. They will make the crosses. They will verify that crosses are true and they grow the F1 and then they, it move ahead. And we call it the, the, the this is part of the cross-cutting operations which provide all services. It's just not have digestion, it's just not developing the process, but they manage everything. They, they harvest your field, they process your data and they provide you the data. And uh, what we need to give is just the list of process that we want, and we get the, the F1. And then it comes the speed breeding, which is how do we use the rapid generation advancement into our breeding system. We started with developing a greenhouse-based rapid generation advancement. And where we grow successfully, we have been able to grow four cycles in a year. But we also understood that probably not everyone will be able to have that facility. And we started doing this in the field also. And this is in very nicely done in, in, in Bangladesh. The advantages and, and all those of speed breeding has already been told. So I will just keep it up to the rise that uh, the way we have integrated into our bidding program is that we have combined this with the genomic selection. And we have not left the, the major genes in the process of applying the, the genomic selection. And that is where comes the, the varietal development. So this is for the favorable breeding program, which is led by Josh Cobb, uh, who joined us from, from Pioneer. And when he, when he came to ED, the first thing that he did was that he analyzed all the lines that was there. He analyzed 17,216 lines. And from those lines, he selected 78 parents, which had higher mean. And in fact, he had started moving ahead with this. He had sequenced these, these 78 parents. And then this is the comparison of the breeding that we were doing earlier, which, which takes a, a product cycle for the six years. And as of now, we, we are somewhere that we, we say that 3.5 years of the product cycle, include using the RGA, using the RGA. And where the F1, F2, F3, F5, F4, F5 is grown, single seed descent method into, into the RGA. And then we do large scale evaluation. But then we follow the same cycle what was shown in the speed breeding that you have the better parent, better lines and that goes again into the, the crossing, crossing cycle. And that is, he even predicted, he had even predicted the predictability of the genomic selection. Uh, we are in the second year of moving forward for the favorable environment but we are very happy the way it is going. Now, as I said earlier, that one of the difference from the other genomic assisted breeding is 
that we have not left the major genes. So we do always capture the major genes for bacterial blight, blast, drought, submergence, but then we also follow the, the genomic selection. What do we want? We have every hope that by 2023, 20, we will reduce this and have this breeding completed within, within three years. And we will have the product in three years. That's what is in favorable environment. Uh, breeding strategy for marginal environment, we are one step back because we have more complications, we have abiotic stress, and so we have a different scheme that we are following, but definitely up to F5, everything will be into the RGA. Either it is field-based RGA or, or it is a greenhouse-based RGA. We also, we selected somewhere around 200 plus lines, which was grown in different parts of, uh, parts of the world, I would say, Africa, Asia, and also South, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and we will be selecting this year a minor set from that, and then we sequence, and then we, we move ahead. Now coming to, to genetic gain, you know, we had a long discussion on genetic gain at ERI, and everyone talks about the genetic gain. So I asked the biometrician at ERI that how I can evaluate the genetic gain, and her first question was, you need to have seven, eight years of continuous data, where at least 20% of lines are common every year, and at least three checks are common. If you don't have it, that's not a great genetic gain trait, it's a trend. You, you, what you get is that the yield gain. Fortunately, we had that. We, we, work in the, we have been working in the Strasa for last 10 years, and we have been following that that 20% of lines were common, checks were common, and we, predict, we calculated the genetic gain, and what we got was that in the Renfed environment, we are getting 34 kg yield increase in non-stress, 25 kg yield increase in moderate stress, 27 kg yield increase in severe stress. You may not be very happy, but it's away from what we were saying that when you breed for the drought, you don't get any yield increase under normal situation. So you are getting yield increase not only under drought, but also under the normal situation. We have done this for the irrigated ecosystem also, and we will come very quickly uh, with the data. But the point that I want to mention here is that if you really want to measure the genetic gain, please ensure that how you standardize your trials. We have started doing it. And that is what is the next. So we have said that we will follow a standard design across groups. We will have a standard reps, how many reps. We will have a standard plot size. We will have five checks. We will ensure that three checks are common over 15 years. And then we measure yield gains. Otherwise, what we measure is just the, the yield gains and not the genetic gain. And we, we will be moving ahead with this, and in fact, from this season, we are implementing it. We have also talk, started talking about, it's not one person who is advancing the, the breeding line from one generation to the next generation, but a group of people talking about that how it moves. It's not that one person says that this is the QTL and use in the breeding program, it needs validation that whether the QTL fulfills all the requirements that we have put in for use in the breeding program. Automation of the data collection, management of the data. If you ask me, each of my experiment, I can get my data from here. How many of us are there that we, you have 12 years or 15 years of data that is available? And how do we reduce the, the errors collecting the data. So we are using barcode, we are using Harvest Master for doing that. At ITIC Reset, where we have a station here, we have also done this in collaboration with ITIC Reset. We are using remote sensing uh, drones for phenotyping, 
for many of the trades, we have not reached to get accurate yield, but definitely we have reached to get accurate height, we have reached to accurate uh, flowering days, and we are working still to, to further refine it. Just note that uh, we are working at ERI, but we are working with uh, many of the, the participating institutes in, in India, Bangladesh, and Nepal to use these principles, and we have a project we call Transforming Rice Breeding, where we are doing the capacity development. Then we also we are introducing the principles, and in fact, uh, uh, earlier this year, there was a workshop even at, at IGKB Raipur, where you can see they are exactly following most of the principles. They have a template, they have a accelerated breeding, which is standardized, they are using RGA, they, they have selected a panel, they have a product profile, and they, they have the modern data collection methods. Uh, we have done similar exercise with NRRI, and uh, we have plans to do more with the many of the other institutes. What next? And that's where I said I have been talking with, uh, Rajiv said that we have been talking about. Uh, we have a PhD student. Uh, I would say still he has to join the PhD, and very, very intelligent. And I have no hitch in saying that one of the intelligent person that I have met with. And when we had this 3K panel, and uh, Vikas started talking to him about the different uh, haplotypes of the alleles or the different traits. And uh, he did very nice exercise, and he came with that not the best alleles, best haplotypes have been used for the breeding as of now. And uh, there are better haplotypes. For example, you can see MOC 1H9 for higher killer numbers. There are haplotypes for the same gene for early, medium, late durations. There are haplotypes for longer panicles. There are haplotypes for better grain quality, they are haplotypes for better iron and zinc content. And in fact, uh, we can tailor rice based on this haplotype reading. Can we do it? We are moving ahead with using that 3K panel to get the haplotypes, best haplotype for the different traits that we need and select the best haplotype for integration and then use that into the breeding. It will be an interesting scenario, probably 10 years from now, and probably we will see many of these best haplotypes are being combined with genomic selection and its field breeding and are used to increase yield in rice and probably in other crops also as many and many more genetic resources are being influenced. This was my last slide. Uh, once again, I, I thank uh, the organizers, and I thank all contributors. This is a presentation from Rice Breeding Platform, and you have seen that whole of the platform has been involved uh, in, in, in contributing to this presentation. And the idea that I had was that how do what we are doing goes to more and more institutes. Thank you very much. Okay, very good, Arvind. Thanks a lot for wonderful presentation, integrating different type of technologies. We have few minutes, so we can take one quick question to Arvind, if someone is having. If not, I think this, yeah, so this is fantastic that everything is very clear, and uh, I think that you, we will have, okay, Shalija Madam is having a question, so can you go to quickly? He is always having a question. Okay, no problem. <laughs> working, madam. This is working. Regarding your last slide of haplotype reading, so many gene combination haplotype. If you have already planned, how do you plan to go about in combining them and eliminating the interactive effects of the genes? Yeah, means uh, that is where, that is, I think it's less of interactive effect of the gene, it is more of the linkage drive. 
it is more of the linkage track. You know, when, when you introgress the a gene into any background, if we don't have a cle clean introgression, many times we carry the linkage drag. I didn't put that slide on interaction between different genes and different alleles. We have, I had two slides on that, that we have to better understand that, those, but definitely you have to make a beginning. You have to bring these better haplotypes into our elite breeding lines and then combine them. Now, I am increased. Uh, when I started combining 10 genes and 12 genes, same questions were asked to me. And I have a product with 12 genes where I have totally avoided all those linkage drags and these interactions. And mind, mind this that, you know, when you combine this genomic assisted breeding with the phenotyping, you take care of many of these, I would say, disadvantageous interactions that you want. And that is what I have done in combining 10 or 12 genes. So it will evolve. It will evolve. We will have, in, we will have those interactions. Some of them will be problem, but it, be, it will evolve. Very good. Okay. Thanks a lot once again. This is fantastic.